We're talking today with Michael Robinson of Muskegon, Michigan. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Mike, begin with some background on yourself and start with where and when were you born? I was born in Grand Haven, Michigan on September 17, 1947 at North Otto Community Hospital. Okay, and was your family living in Grand Haven or they somewhere They just else? moved to Grand Haven. They were lived in Chicago until just before I moved, and then when they moved, it probably helped the things along. And <laughs> All right. Now, did you grow up in Grand Haven, or did you move until around? Until I was six, about the sixth grade, and then we uh, uh, we moved to Saginaw because my father got a better job. Okay. And, and what kind of work was your father doing? He was a salesman for construction aggregates which was a stone and gravel company, okay. and he ended up doing over on the other side of state, and I don't remember the name of that. All right. Uh, and then, did you finish high school? Yes, I did. And what year did you graduate? Uh, 66. Okay. And what did you do after you got out of high school? Dodged a draft and went to Delta College for a year in Saginaw. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, at this point, uh, how much do you know about Vietnam? Sitting in front of him, I was on a boat, and they told me he would go in here. And I, well, no, but the point when you're, yeah. uh, we're still at the point in your story where you haven't gone in the military yet. Okay. But you say you're dodging the draft and going to oh. Delta College for a year, so. I mean, it, yes, I understand what you're saying. I had an older brother, Steve, that uh, was in Vietnam in 1965, and uh, he had gone through ROTC in the for the Air Force, and he got orders to go over there. So when I was still in high school, he was over there, and he used to let us know what was going on a little bit. And he was so close to the fighting and all that. And okay. So your impression was that would be good to stay out of? Yeah, it sure was. It all was right. a very good impression to say that. That's why I tried to go to the... I was not a very good student, so I uh, went to Delta College for a year, and it wasn't good for me. Okay. So basically, you leave school, and once you leave school, you don't have a draft deferment. No, correct. All right. And then, did you get a draft notice? Yes, I did. Okay. And what did you do once you got that notice? I thought about it, and I said, geez, two years in the Army on the ground in Vietnam. Or I could be four years in Navy on a ship five miles offshore. I think I'll go into the Navy. And, of course, that's not what happened. All right. Uh, do you remember what time of year it was? that you went in? I, it's after, it's probably mid-summer or late summer or okay. early fall or something like that. All right. So it's sort of after the, 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 the spring term or whatever, yeah, you after, go to college and you're out. And, and now they, they found out about it. They says, oh. Okay. All right. Uh, now when you went to sign up for the Navy, uh, what kinds? What did the recruiter tell you you could expect? Or yeah, he says make out a list of ten things you want to do in the Navy. It seems you're going in for four years, and uh, so I, you have to give at least ten. So I started listening, and I, I love photography. So I said I want to be a photographer's mate, and so I listed that up front, and, mm -hmm. and he said no, you got to keep going till you get all ten of them filled out. Well, the last thing I could come up with was the gunner's mate. You know, he what he did went. <laughs> You're going to be a gunner's mate. So that's how I became into weapons. All right. Now, did you uh, go through a physical, or had you done that already before the draft? Or no, I, 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 when I went in the Navy, they, they sent me to a physical. I did my boot camp in Great Lakes, Illinois. Okay. Now, what did the boot camp consist of? Um, just normal drill and. First, they knock you down to nothing, make you feel like dirt, and then they build you back up to be a military person. You know, that type of thing. All right. Well, what kinds of things do they do to knock you down? Um, they just uh, an awful lot of marching and physical, uh, a lot of physical stuff, and a lot of uh, a lot of training, uh, and schooling, and uh, uh, of course, uh, drills and. That kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, was there stuff on just, just how to keep your uniform and your gear? Yes, we had to learn. Well, I, I, yes, that was solely part of it, but I had already learned how to take care of myself and keep you know, my clothes clean and all that. I had a very good mother, and she taught us how to 
you do your dishes, you do your own clothes and, and all that stuff. So that helped me because I wasn't starting from scratch. I mean, a lot of these people were doing and it was easy for me to take care of myself. All right. Uh, what kind of people were you training alongside? Do you have any sense of what their backgrounds were? Yeah, there was a, two different styles. One was a, was a, I want to say he was a New Yorker, a city of New Yorker. He's a you know gang, cool, badass. You know he knows toughness. And another one of the other ones was a guy from uh, Tennessee Hills, real hillbilly, literally a hillbilly, and he. Uh, he wasn't know how to keep himself clean and stuff like that. And the city guy he was really hard on him, and, and uh, he was gonna teach the uh, little Tennessee little, little little guy. He's a little tiny guy. He's gonna teach him a lesson. He's gonna take him into the what we call the drying room. You wash your own clothes and you hang him up to dry in this real hot room. And uh, he's gonna take him in and kick his ass and make him clean up because we get demerited the more. And, uh, he went in there, smack his fan in his fist. He's gonna kick this little Tennessee boy's ass. Well, about less than three or four minutes later, the little teeny Tennessee guy came out with a shitting grin on his face, and uh, we all kind of watched him walk away. And he nothing, absolutely nothing. About ten minutes later, he, you know, the old uh, New York tough badass guy, come out all bloodied and <laughs> beat up and. Uh, but, uh, well, did the guy from Tennessee learn to clean up? No. He ended up getting out because they, they put him in a, what they call a mouse house, was trying to get him to do that. He never learned. And he ended up getting out. You know. mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, now, and how long was the boot camp part, do you think? I really don't know. I want to say at least uh, three months or more. Okay. Like All right. Um, I guess the Army was eight weeks fairly consistently by then, but the Navy could do things their well, own Well, maybe way. it was less, because I don't really remember well, for it sure. Have, it, it, could have been, it could have been 12 it weeks. It seemed like a long forever for me. <laughs> yeah. All right. And now, did you understand what they were doing at the time, this idea of breaking you down and building you up, or did you just figure that out later? Oh, I, I kind of knew about that, because like I say, I had an old brother who was in the Air Force, and, and he went through an ROTC in college, and uh, he went through some of this and then we kind of, you know, we didn't much touch and everything, so we, I kind of knew what they were doing okay. and I was always going to be the best I could be, so I didn't get picked on. The more you, the more you didn't uh, uh, abide by the rules, the more they made you. And so I kind of just said, hey, I think I'll just do the right thing from the very beginning and mm -hmm. kind of stay the hell out of everybody's way. Okay. You know? Yeah, that seems to be a good approach. Yeah. All right. Uh, so once you finish that, uh, now what do they do with you? Uh, I went to weapons schools. It was uh, the big, uh, big weapons like five-inch fifty-fours and all that kind of dry rows, how to operate the, I mean, uh, to um, do maintenance on the big ships when they roll, the guns stay stable. And our job was to uh, fix and repair all that kind okay. of stuff. And where were you doing the gunnery school? In Great Lakes. Okay, so you're staying at Great Lakes. Now, are you actually going out onto ships now, or is it still on shore? Just at, just on shore. Yeah, we can go on any ships until after, after we're all done. All right, now, uh, are you really firing any of the guns, or were you just working with the, just, the, the gyros and the stabilization? Yeah, that kind of stuff. We didn't do any firing along the way we're on. They were just teach us how to fix things. Okay. Now, while you're there, do you get to go off the base at all? Yes, we did. We did a little bit of partying, you know, and uh, we tried to, uh, you know, do the best we could to stay in one piece, <laughs> terrorizing the world. All right. Well, did you go into Chicago or just stay up near the base? Uh, I had some relatives that live in Chicago, so on weekends I got to go to their house, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of a really big thing to have home cooking and sleep in a real bed and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But most of it was on base, but every once in a while in the weekend where I got to, and I'd even come home some weekends, I was still doing back to, back to Saginaw. Okay. And now, do you have a recollection of when it was that you finished the gunnery school? 
was it still 67 at this point before I, Christmas or I really don't know I do not know exactly when it happened but you always remember where you spent Christmas of 67 I may have been able to go home it's possible okay because I don't all right so after gunnery school what's the next step for you well they uh, sent us out into the fleet and I was on a, a a ship that wasn't even, uh, it was in dry dock. And uh, so I didn't really get out in the sea, but I was stationed to it. And then they quickly sent me on a different ship. It was an ocean, mo ocean going minesweeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was told once you get on those, you don't get to get off. And I'm thinking, damn, that's great. Because I don't want to go to Vietnam, because like I say, it was going on pretty good then. And, uh, so when I got orders for there, I was very, very happy. All right. Where was that ship based? Uh, I think it was Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. I'm not sure, but and I think did, so. And did you actually get to serve on that ship for a yes, while? Yes, yes, and I was very happy. <laughs> and I ended up being the ship's diver because uh, they pull probably almost a quarter mile, to, maybe maybe it is a mile, I don't know, a lot, very long uh, a cable. What they do is they, the mine sweeper is made out of wood, mm -hmm. so they send down a, signals and find the mines and then the cable comes along and they got cutters on them they cut them loose and they pop up the surface we had uh, 20 million uh, cannons on there one single and when they supposedly top pop up the surface we would shoot them and blow them up mm -hmm. but they this is all mock back then and uh, they would float a 55 gallon drum half full of diesel fuel and you try and hit this with this cannon which it was almost impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, so what does the diver do? Um, well, this is why how I became divers. Our new commanding officer on board stopped. Well, the cable doesn't. It's still coming forward. Mm -hmm. And it wrapped around our screws. So we were out there for about three days, dead water. We couldn't even go get into, into the wake we had we got sideways and because we, we couldn't turn on our screws or anything so we had to, we had to have uh, divers come out and cut the cables off the screws so we could get back in and mm -hmm. they said well we got to have somebody on board and I was a very good swimmer in Grand Haven I, yeah mm -hmm. I'll be you know okay uh, that was another don't volunteer okay <laughs> so that's, that's I went to uh, school for that and, and uh, did some training basically we never ran into that problem again, so I didn't really, I went to uh, a lot of training in in, sh in the rivers, and, and it was a, And the, was this still near Charleston where you were doing Yeah, that? I think so, yeah, because we were in the river so filthy dirty you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and so uh, I was supposed to go down, I was supposed to go down and feel around the screws and see if there's anything around them, well, it's kind of a weird feeling being pitch black. And, and so I, I did it, but uh, thank God we never came across that. Mm -hmm. At least if you were out in open ocean, you might be able to see through I, the water. I was hoping that, yeah. yeah. All right. About how long did you wind up staying on the minesweeper? It's supposed to have been forever, and right. it wasn't. I think it was more like, a, I want to say maybe six months or so. I don't really know, but I know my officer coming out there so happy. He said, you got your order from Vietnam? And I said, kiss my ass. And, uh, All right. So, um, so I think we're getting into 1968 now at this point. If you're there that that amount of time, the uh, latter, latter part of yeah, yeah, 68, okay. early part of 68. Because you get to Vietnam at the end of 68. Right. So okay. Uh, now a lot of stuff was going on in 68. I mean, you had I mean the, the Tet Offensive went yes. on early in the year, and then Johnson decides not to run, and Martin Luther King gets assassinated, and eventually Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated. Uh, did any of that stuff um, get noticed where you were? Um, I can't remember right now, but um, I'm sure it did have some effect on our. Uh, hmm orders and stuff that I, I can't really remember okay. a whole lot. Yeah, but it's just not something that stands out in your memory because you're focusing on what yeah. you're doing on the ship at that point. Yeah, well, I was on that minesweeper. Uh, something must have happened to ramp up the war 
we didn't know about mm -hmm. as, a, as a very uh, low ranked person that uh, I think things that got a little more heated, so they had to ramp up a little more. Okay. Training. Well, I mean, I think some of it kind of is indicated by the nature of, of, of your story and what comes next. So you get orders, you're going to go to Vietnam, but you don't go straight to Vietnam. No. Oh, where do you go next? Uh, Coronado, California is where the, the West Coast Smith Bolson was doing, did all their training. Okay. So I went there, uh, there's ten, 10 crews of five apiece, or six apiece, six mm -hmm. people on each boat, and they, they got 10 of us groups like that and we all train together and uh, we learn. The boat, because it's so small, only 50 foot long and, and you can go like this and two guys can touch the sides, it's pretty narrow, that we had to learn everybody else's job. That's why it took us so long. We had to learn the radars, the radios, the, the engines, the weapon system, uh, helmsmen, how to take care of stuff. And, that's why it took so long. Okay, so how many months was that? I, I want to say it was months. I want to say it seems like it was like three months to me. I don't. Yeah, know. That's quite yeah. likely. Because it was a long time, and then I was so happy because we, we had to go, also go through survival training, where we had to learn how to survive if we got separated from the boat. Okay. And what did that consist of? That was uh, pretty hell. Uh, we went up to Woodby Island up in the state of Washington, and the first part of the week you're there for a whole week, they don't feed you. you, you only, whatever you got to eat is what you, you forage, and they teach you how to uh, dig in low tide, how to dig snails with your, or clams or whatever the hell you mm -hmm. dig. <laughs> and, I didn't, uh, and, uh, and you always had to be doing it like in a scenario where you've got to be careful. So you only got to go out there at night in low tide. And we would dig, uh, if we got our bucket full, and it was probably about uh, eight inches tall and about six inches in diameter, if we got that full for our group, which is like 12, 14 of us, mm -hmm. then we could keep digging because they gave us a time period and you can eat whatever you can get from then on. And of course, I don't like seafood, so, but I tried it because you get pretty hungry. and. Uh, couldn't do it, no, I, but they, that's what they did. And then after a while they teach you how to do snares, how to catch rabbits and stuff like that. And uh, so basically, and then of course they did uh, um, how to, uh, if you're walking down the trail, how to, get, you know, if you come up across a VC, how to shoot because you, you, you right there all of a sudden this thing, big thing, Pops up. It's supposed to be a VC jumped out in front of you, and you're supposed to know what to do. And you you, you shoot the first one low, so you can see where it hit. And then you bring it up to the height of the target, so that you do boom, boom, two quick shots, and and you only get two shots, so you've got to hit it supposedly. And we did that, and uh, that was quite a experience. And then after that, they we learned how to do all that. Then they decided that. Uh, Okay, you got to go through a capture stage, and they, said, they gave us a compass and a, a map, and says you got to go to point A to point B, and you've got so much time to do it. And there's so many of you. I don't know how many it was, like maybe four or something like that. And uh, he's supposed to make that point. If you make it to that point, without getting captured, then you went to the next point, and the key one thing to learn how to use a compass, obviously, mm -hmm. and that uh, we. Uh, we're, we did very well. In fact, I, I'm a kind of a country boy living up in Grand Haven and stuff, and we lived on an old farm. And so we, I knew how to play in the woods, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I could spot movement, so I knew when to get the hell down and stop and freeze and all that. And so we made it all the way through. And most people didn't. Mm -hmm. Most groups didn't. And say, after you get out of them, we said, well, we, we made it. They said, yeah, come on. They, can't, they, they, they put concentration camps, camps anyway just to get for, this, for the experience of being in a, in that scenario of being mm -hmm. captured. And uh, then they start uh, doing a lot of things to you, trying to break you mentally. And 
of course, they beat you up in propaganda and uh, one of the things that I, there are two things I had problems on, on small spaces and drowning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, of course, that's the thing they worked on the right. most. Oh, you're, you're, in the Vietnam, there's water, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would take, it, take you and put you in this box about maybe this wide and just wide enough for your shoulder, but just long enough to where you had to, uh, you know, on your hands and knees type thing, and they push the top down until you're down and right against your face, against the floor almost, and then they lock it, and they leave you there. And it really works on your mind. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I, I play golf <laughs> in my head, mm -hmm. keep me busy, and uh, I. When I got out, I was a little bit, probably a little bit screwed up, but I didn't. They, of course, they close your commanding officer and they keep slapping you around in the light and trying to get you to give your, the name of your commanding officer. Oh, shit, I was so freaking scared I couldn't remember his name anyway. And, uh, and then uh, they kept, they did that for a while. And, uh, Put us in classes again, the propaganda classes. And if you didn't pay attention, they grabbed the. Of course, I'm trying to always uh, resist type of thing, and uh, I was not being cooperative. Mm -hmm. They grabbed me by my hair and pulled me out of the room and pulled a gun to my head and pulled the trigger a couple of times, and I knew that they. God, they're not going to kill us. So I kind of half-assed believed that they weren't going to kill me, but you kind of get weird. Yeah. And then they, that didn't do it for them, so they put me in a, you know what a 55-gallon drum is, you know mm -hmm. how tall they are. What they did is they welded them, a whole bunch of like four of them together, so it's, you got a big long tube you're in, and they set the, the end of the tube, one on the ground and one on a board, and then they, Shove me down there head first. And it's full of water. And it's just going over the edge and just laying flat or almost flat. And he's standing up and then it's, you you can't get up and yeah. high enough to get out of the water. And they wait until you 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 last person there mm -hmm. and they bring you back down and haul you out and of course. You, okay. you, now, you, it seems like an awful lot of production for somebody who's gonna be an enlisted man on a swift boat. Um, in terms of why are they doing all of this so stuff? We're, good, we're going to be in an area where we're going to get maybe captured. That's possible. Yeah, very possible. And so that was one of their reasons for this was to see what we could um, take. And mm -hmm. I, I think that was a, a separation point because when we got back from there, they uh, said, well, a lot of people got didn't, uh, I mean, we got too many, too many uh, crews over there, so we're going to send you all back to the fleet. I think that was when they were, the ones that didn't make, because they made us go into a concentration camp where they made you pick up bulbers and mm -hmm. move them to this pile, and then, ah, no, move them back over here, you know, and they, they broke you. They did everything they could to break you. They got a lot of people that did break, and mm -hmm. they were up there on the walls, acting like a chicken and everything. I mean, there's some people that really broke bad. And uh, it was, I think that's what they were doing. They were weeding out the ones that couldn't make it. And uh, so when we got back down to... Uh, Coronado? Yeah, Coronado, thank you. <laughs> going crazy. And uh, that's when he told us we are going to go back to the fleet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was so happy. And a lot of them did. And then there was one more group left that was my, my group, our, our six guys. And I says, hey, where's our order? You gave everybody else orders, where are the eyes? And he looked down in his office, I was going to go to the office to get my new orders. And he pulled up my papers and handed them to me, it's the same ones. Mm -hmm. And he said, you got a week. Get your, get everything in order. And so I called my mom and said, hey, I'm going after all, you know. And of course, she was so goddamn mad at the Navy. That, uh, but 
went out and got shit-faced drunk. <laughs> I was just not just about ready to turn 21, so that was in September. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, we went off base and got drunk or a skunk, and I ended up in jail somewhere. <laughs> All right. and, uh, now this is Coronado by San Diego, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. We were, and in general, how do the locals seem to view the sailors? Not very well. Not very well. They didn't like them. And probably more because we were probably kind of rowdy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't blame them because we were stupid. And uh, but it, anyways, I got thrown in jail for I don't know exactly what, but I know we were drinking because I got... And, they couldn't get out of me who I got my alcohol from. And I kept saying, it's just a minute, and I'd throw up. And, <laughs> and they didn't ask me again, I said, just a minute. Mm -hmm. Well, they said, oh, okay, you get a cop. And so they, that's when they kept me overnight and sent me back the next day. And, uh, All right. So now how do they get you to Vietnam? They uh, flew us. After they gave us 10 billion shots, you know, they gave, filled us with arms full of shots and they walk you down the line with these guns that shoot into, they're not needles, they actually just mm -hmm. shoot a stream of medicine and, and uh, after I don't know how many shots, then they put us on an airplane and uh, we got to, uh, not California, to uh, Hawaii and they knocked us off the planes to get more shots and that's all I saw of uh, uh, Hawaii was there get off the airport, go through a line, and get back on, and I ship us off to Vietnam. Okay. And where did you land in Vietnam? I think Cameron Bay. Okay. All right. What was your first impression of Vietnam when you got there? Um, it, that was a pretty stable part of the country with a mm -hmm. big Air Force base there and all that, so I just kind of like, wow. You know, not until that they uh, flew us down to uh, Cat Low, Coastal Division 13, did, you know, it was getting a little tighter. And uh, Like I said, I came on base and I had my duffel bag and all the stuff in hand, and they, they said, oh, come on, come on, come on. They took me down to the pier, and that boat, the picture of the boat had been rocketed. He said, that's in your boat. And holy shit, of course, that, I didn't have to go on that one, because it was pretty bad up. So the boat that you were supposed to go on had just been shot up. Yeah, he okay. got knocked out the night, the night before. All right. Uh, now, are you joining an existing crew as the new guy, or what's happening? Yes, it's a one person. You know, we, we, we went over there as a crew, but they only allow one new guy in the boat at a time because they don't know how you're going to react, especially mm -hmm. as a gunner's mate. I couldn't be on the main guns because they didn't know if I would freeze on it. And so that was every, everybody did the same thing they did to all of us. We all went on a different boat. and. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, just describe a little bit um, what a swift boat is, is like. You said it's 50 feet long, it's pretty narrow at the beam, um, and what's it for? It's a river patrol boat. Um, further up north, as you go, because I was always down in the Delta area, mm -hmm. but up north of DMZ, they actually patrolled the ocean a little bit too. And uh, uh, that's when the North Vietnamese didn't have aircraft, and they could come over the ocean and knock out them. So they, they were in pretty bad shape too. But uh, we just ran the rivers. Mm -hmm. We didn't we didn't go out in the ocean. The only time we ever went out in the ocean is when we did a one day patrol, and that was supposed to guard the base. It was a day off basically. You mm -hmm. just took them out on base, and we would go out to the ocean, and right there, that was. Um, in country on our place, so it was pretty, pretty safe patrol to have. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't remember. I think it was Bung Tao. Bung Tao, Bung, that that would fit that description, yeah. Yeah, it's Bung, Bung Tao, and so we went out, you know, get around on the beaches, partying all the time. So it wasn't really a patrol, mm -hmm. even though we had to go back in behind him. But I mean, that was all friendly. Okay, so well, did you go into the ocean to get from the? Estuary of one river to another, kind of in and out of the rivers in the delta? Yes, every one of them. Uh, we would leave the, the Saigon Basin or whatever mm -hmm. it was and travel along the ocean just to get to our patrol river. Right. Okay. Uh, and as a gunner's mate, what's your job? Uh, I was forward gunner to the main defense and destruction, both. We, uh, uh, 
I sat up high, real high, so I could really see what was going on. And uh, I was the main defense and the main uh, destruction. Okay. And what kind of weapon did you have? I, I at the beginning, I just had two twelve, uh, two twelve, two fifty caliber machine guns. Mm -hmm. And as I realized this, when we would do search and rescue, and uh, re rescue the search, mm -hmm. that my fifties could not were useless because I couldn't get the guns down too far. Mm -hmm. So I ended up carrying an M16 behind me in an M79 Gurleen launcher. And uh, so when we pulled up alongside a sandpan, I would take my M16 down and mm -hmm. uh, they would, a lot of times they would pull me out of there completely and go down and do the search because I was useless up there mm -hmm. with the big, big guns anyway. So they said, well, you do the search and <laughs> thanks a lot, buddy. And uh, so I did, did a lot of the climbing to the Sand pans and checking for stuff. All right. Uh, what was your main base? Catlow. All right. And describe what that facility looked like. Um, it's a big flotation of piers, and they, they had uh, uh, barracks there, uh, commissaries, uh, hospital type places, and uh, uh, big big warehouse for food because we would have to when we go on patrol if we went on it like a two and three day patrols we would get an allotment to have uh, food We because we cooked our own foods on board while we were out. And so we had places like that and the mess halls and places to drink. Right. And how much time would you actually spend at the base? Uh, we would go on a one day patrol, then they have a, a day off. Mm -hmm. Then we'd go on a two day patrol and they have a day off. Then a three day patrol and they have a day off. All right. And what do you do during the day off? A little bit of drinking, sleeping. Uh, more than a little bit of drinking. Quite a bit of drinking, sleeping, and uh, have our own bed and all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of nice. You had your own locker, and uh, you had you know, barracks. It was kind of nice. It was very well nice. And the showers, and that was nice because we didn't get the showers on board the boats. Right. We had to just jump in the river. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see now. Did you have to stay on the base? No. Uh, it's supposedly all friendly around the base, so a lot of people went out. And I know I, one of my favorite foods was they made uh, french fries using pure uh, butter. And that tasted so good. <laughs> and, and so. Of course, it's like five bucks for a little pack of French fries, but they'd have a little Vietnamese would have a bunch of little stores and stuff to buy and get in trouble in. Mm -hmm. and women and uh, things to buy and places to eat. And, but at night we were all supposed to be back inside. Mm -hmm. And were there uh, ever problems with Viet Cong in, in the village? Yeah, we. Um, Normally not individually, but one one time we we were all in base and I was sleeping in my my rack, which the bunk the the, the houses what, what do you call it barracks our barracks was long and uh, mine have to be way up front by the showers my bunk and uh, we we heard a mortar leave a mortar when you hear that boom when it goes off and. Boom, it hit pretty damn close. I said, Jesus Christ, you idiots, you're almost hitting us. Well, it wasn't us shooting, it was mm -hmm. them shooting at us. And they hit our barracks for that to fire back in, and all the people back there were on patrols. Mm -hmm. So nobody nobody got hurt. The building got damaged, but nobody got hit. And the officer in charge of our base security, I sit in the bunkers and stuff like that, and uh, Sandbag area. They says they they know where the gunmen are from, and they're right there. Can we shoot them? And he says, Oh, yeah, that's all friendly over there. And no, no, it's not. You know, <laughs> it's not all friendly over there. And uh, we never they never shot back. They weren't allowed to. Mm -hmm. And we went out on, got on the boats, uh, the duty boat. We get on the boat and go behind that area to so try to cut them off. And we never did find the people that did it. And. Uh, but they never did that again. So, okay. you know. Did they just fire a couple of rounds and leave? Oh, six. Yeah. Okay. 
six mortars and left, I guess, I mean, cause I didn't, we never found anything. All right, but there weren't cases of people going into the village and having trouble with the VC or no. things like that? No, we, we uh, supposedly all friendlies. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Uh, now, do you remember your first uh, mission on the swift boat? Yes, the very first Sea Lord read. Yeah, I was, um, I was so fresh in country, and uh, they, we went up one of these rivers, and then we went off on this um, canal, and we went, it's a pitch black as night, just, and we chugged up there real slow. We have a radar that we can see where their, their nets were spaced across the river, so we, we could maneuver around them. And so I can't see nothing because it's pitch black, but the guy in the helm could. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we went all the way up to where I was going to show you that the, where the VC supposedly had some of our guys captured. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they're supposed to go up, and uh, there's a T in the, in the canal, and we were supposed to go up there and go to that T, and then if nothing happened, we'd turn around and come back out. But, we would get up there and nothing, of course. And the minute we started to turn around, they hit us from everywhere. And I was on the, because I wasn't allowed in the 50s, they put me on the bow with an M60 machine gun. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so much light for them, because you couldn't see, because there is no street lights or anything like mm -hmm. that. So we, uh, the, the only, Anything you could see would basically from the flash of the guns, and you, you shot at mm -hmm. flashes of guns, and and, uh, and there was some big stuff that came in, but it went over our heads, and I just shot at everything. I it was whatever. We, we we turned around and ran our asses back out there, and think, and I sat back, thinking, oh my God, we made it. <laughs> Nobody got hit, and the officer says, reload. We're going back in. I said, you're out of your freaking mind, you know? And on an M6 machine gun, you take the handle and you flip it this way, you can dump the barrel right off, mm -hmm. lock a new one on, and a nice new barrel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why I did. I put a new barrel on and reloaded, and we, we turned around and uh, went back in at full bore. Because they, when you're out in the ocean, if you know if you're going out to Lake Michigan, you can be 20 miles inland and still hear the power boats going. So they didn't know exactly where we were, but they, they heard us, but they didn't know where we were. Mm -hmm. They didn't realize we were coming straight at them, and our exhaust going behind us, and they didn't hear us coming. So they, they were out on their had campfires going, the cooking fires going. Uh, they're outside the bunkers, and they're, everybody's sitting around. And we came in there and started just blasting away. Right, we got up to that tee again. And we slammed down the brakes, basically stopped, and from here that was, about 20 feet in front of me, was a, a VC in a sand pan, caught him dead right in the middle of the river. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, what am I going to, well, I, I leveled my M60 at him, and I killed him. Mm -hmm. And uh, we... I, I don't know what else we did. I mean, I know we had, I did a lot more shooting because we got we're still getting shot at from all over. And I know a lot of the times, I don't know if you see this in some of the movies of the Afghanistan where they're, they're shooting like this, you know, and they're aiming at their, and I'm pretty sure there's a lot of that because we had an awful lot of firepower. So they didn't want to stand up and mm -hmm. be brave because we could, thing is, we could rip bunkers apart, buildings apart, knock trees down with my with the fifties, mm -hmm. not my M sixty, but yeah. so they didn't. Uh, they weren't too accurate in their shooting, but they were shooting. You could see the muzzle flashes, and you could hear some of the bullets go whizzing by. But uh, I didn't. Uh, we just turned around and shot our way out, and oh man, we made it the second time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so. Was, and was your boat by itself on this mission? No, we never go on raids. See, it's at least two to three or four sometimes. And uh, I don't remember how, in our patrol areas themselves, we always have two. Okay. And then if we go on the raids, it's probably, probably three. Okay. Now, you're using the term Sea Lord. What does that refer to? That's a type of uh, a raid that they, they gave a name to. Okay. That it was in the, uh, out, go out and 
we we were going to go do some damage. We know where the VC are. Mm -hmm. We were going to go in there and uh, rip the place apart. Okay. Now, as far as you know, did you always encounter Viet Cong as opposed to North Vietnamese Never. troops? Never. I, 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 I have no idea. Uh, I just saw muzzle flashes. Okay. And that one poor guy in the sandpan, I don't think he was a uh, North Vietnamese mm -hmm. regular. I think he was just a uh, regular guy was told that you shoot at the Americans right. or you die or your daughter dies. So, right. uh, now, what proportion of your missions were conducted at night? I want to say that the heavy duty ones, the Sea Lord raids, were about 50%. Because mm -hmm. a couple of times, a lot of times we did day raids too. All right. Um, now, I guess you've got. You have a, you've written a memoir, which we can include actually in, in, in the file we make for your interview here, uh, and you talk about a variety of incidents. Uh, another one, different kind of incident. Uh, we talked, you talked a little bit about going out in, in the ocean, and if you're going out in the ocean um, in a small boat like this, could that be dangerous or at least Well, not when you're out there. Is this when you're trying to come into, during the monsoon scenes, come into that, in the Saigon Basin, because the waves start coming up there the land and then they get so huge here. They're bigger than us. Mm -hmm. And uh, going in, we would uh, back in because the waves were pushing us in. And so we get at the top of the wave, we'd have to power up it so you need to get pushed all the way down to the ground. Then, you know, back in the boat and get just buried into the ground. So we'd power up it. And as it went by us, we'd come this way and, and then we'd try to back up to to go up the thing so you don't hit so hard at the, at the, on the front of the wave. So we had to keep maneuvering forward and backwards and get... We, we tried to, you know, we had to, of course, we could thank God we could lock it all up and close it all off, but uh, so you wouldn't get buried mm -hmm. nose first or ass first into the, into the ground. And we had some people that did. And uh, it, it's, it's, that was very dangerous. And when you're bringing the, now is the base itself, does it have a breakwater or something to protect you against the waves? Or? Yeah, you go around the, the, the uh, where our base was, because going up the river basin, that was one thing, but we, our base was over to the side, mm -hmm. and so there was no waves there at all. Okay. It was just a, a river coming down. But you had to get through the area that had the waves. First. Yeah, we had to get through that, and when we got through that, we were home free, basically. All right. Uh, now, what different kinds of missions did you have over the course of your time there? We had um, uh, gun support missions. We had troop insurgents and sea lord rage type things like that. Um, the um, we would uh, troop insurgents. We would back them up. In other words, we, we, we get like, they get up like six or eight big huge sand pans or whatever and hold the troops on us and load us with a bunch of troops and we go in as shallow as we can and they, those boats would be going the uh, shallow water so they would go in and we would stay out there with our support with the 81 in my 50s and... Uh, okay, the 81, explain what that is. That's an 81 millimeter mortar, single, single shot that you can do a couple things with that. One, you can drop the mortar down, just like you see on the TV, they drop the mortar and go boom. And we also had a, 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 a trigger system on ours. So if we wanted to kind of lower the angle to where we want to shoot at something with different type of rounds, that we could stand it up straight, cock the, the, the firing pin back, then drop it down in there, and it would seat, but it wouldn't go off. So then we could aim it like a great big shotgun. Okay. And we could do it. So you could use direct fire with a mortar oh, crew. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, it was uh, definitely. Uh, we only had to use that twice. I only remember using it twice, and it was so devastating that uh, we were in a bad firefight. And this one bank was just tearing us apart, and he only had an M uh, um, fifty once a single fifty on his top of his mortar, but he had that mortar too, mm -hmm. eighty one, and I cannot shoot straight behind me, and uh, we, were, we were getting hit pretty good, and he couldn't, it wasn't, his 50 calibers couldn't hit everything all at once, mm -hmm. so he just 
leveled at 81 and, and let that, that thing go and the whole bank went whoosh, and there's nothing. There was not a single sound after that. This was an anti-personnel round? Or yeah, it has a, thousands of tiny little darts and I have in my hat there that shows you what they are. They're uh, little black darts that um, okay. they, sure. they're they packed in there and it's, it's 81 millimeter long around and probably about that long since there's thousands of rounds in there and of course as soon as it leaves the mortar barrel it spreads out like this. Okay. And, so is this called a flechette round? Or yes, a flechette. Okay. I think uh, it might be called be behind round two I think. Yeah. Uh, but that, that same might be a whole bunch of little yeah, it, it, things. So a, but a giant shotgun effect. Yeah basically. Okay. Uh, all right now the uh, troops that you were bringing in uh, did you have, did you form much of an impression of them or get to know any of them or would you just see them once and that was it? I didn't get, the South Vietnamese I did not get a good impression of because they, uh, uh, they, they were going to have their, they were not there for, they thought they were right fighting our war. They really believed that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, we were starting to turn our boats over to the South Vietnamese. We were going to go into, they knew we were going to go, the people that were supposed to go on our boat with us and be, Training with us, mm -hmm. when they found out where we were going, they wouldn't show up, and uh, so we knew, oh, this is going to be something because they they won't even show up. Mm -hmm. So it usually was a little bit more of a gunfight than uh, that they they do. It's probably their brothers or something. Thing. I don't know. Okay, so you would take South Vietnamese troops in. Yeah. Would you take American troops in as well? Um, we a couple of times we 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 took in some of our um, our Marines and and uh, stuff like that. I want to see uh, Navy SEALs. SEALs, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Navy SEALs. Uh, we we were gonna go up this one canal that went back to uh, we know it was a very strong, big stronghold for the DC, and we were supposed to go up there and tear them into whatever. And uh, we got part way up there, and we knew this was there that they had a they put a a barricade underwater about a foot and a half below the water line. So when I, when we take, at slow speed, we take three feet of water. I mean, we have all our stuff, our props and everything hanging mm -hmm. underneath, so we couldn't go up there. And we had uh, like eight tubes, almost the length of our boat, of C4. And they packed it around that huge monstrous barricade they had. And and then we backed off, I don't know how far, but a very, very long way. And they detonated it, and the water and everything flew about 30, 40 feet in the air. It was unbelievable. And after they cleared our way, we went in and did our thing. Mm -hmm. And we also had the, uh, we know where the VC were, and we know the campsites were, and uh, there's way inland. And we, we sent some Marines or means or seals or whatever, inland to capture, I guess, some general. And so we ended up doing a run our bow up on the beach real tight. So we were really stable. Got these quick grid coordinates to where we know where they're going to be and they knew where they're going to be. And we set up our mortars. Uh, you have to change the uh, distance that the mortar flies. You have little powder bags on the side of them that when you're dropping down the mortar, they get so much push. And of course, in the angle and all that stuff, they figure out. And so we were ready to support them, and they were going to go in and do this, get this army's general or whatever. And we were waiting, and I don't know how many, it seems like forever, before they got on the radio and says, We got them, we're on our way out. And you could hear that they were running you know, they were <laughs> on the radio. And so we said, Okay. And a little bit, not too long later, says, uh, uh, we need support. Drop some rounds in on our position right here. And they told us where it was, and of course they were on the run, so once we dropped the rounds there, they were away. And we did that, and we could hear the gunfire. You know, they're in, they're in a firefight. And we kept telling us that. Uh, they did that a couple of times, and then finally says, uh, 
they came on here and they're very, very excited. And they said that uh, we're pinned down. They got us surrounded, dropped some mortars right on top of us. Mm -hmm. Right on top of you? So we did. And uh, nothing. Jesus Christ, we just killed them? <laughs> it was like, in between the other transmissions, there were only like five minutes or so. This was 10 or 15 minutes, mm -hmm. nothing. So we thought we killed them. And they came back on the radio. Oh yeah, we got them. We're coming on out. And I mean, as calm as could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came out and, and we were saying, Jesus Christ, you know. And they're smiling and laughing, and one of the guys reaches in his pockets and says, here. And dropped it in one of our guys' hands as part of our mortar. Mm -hmm. Thanks, he said. Did they come out carrying with a Vietnamese prisoner? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, don't I just remember they coming up there as happy as hell. And, yeah. and, and uh, I'm assuming they had because they said them all the whole time. They said they had them, they had them, you know. And they're coming out with them. And then that last bit when they finally came out and uh, said thanks. That's all they said, you know. <laughs> That's kind of now when you're bizarre going up these rivers, you, you get into the canals and the very narrow waterways. Oh. Uh, how hard was it to maneuver? What kinds of things did you have to do in there? Well, they were always when we got into the canals, they, we we couldn't turn around. We had to they, if we were going to turn around, we had to ram the bow up on the beach, back off, ram the bow up on the beach, back off, ram the bow up the beach to death until we got. Turn it around because you it is too obvious. The rivers are too narrow to even have the credit. Would you do that under fire? Yes. Okay. Um, the last one I was on, we went up. It's supposed to be uh, there's going to be four of us, and we're going to run up this one canal that we knew would belong to the VCs. And uh, we were supposed to come in with four boats in a row, coming in like a lickety split. And the canal went in at an angle and then did a hard right about, I don't know, not very far, but less than a quarter of a mile. And then go up there. And it was very, very narrow. And as we were going to go up there, the, the, the command boat was the last boat in line. And uh, he was. He wanted to be the lead boat, and we were lead boat. So we had to stop. You could take four great big boats with two 12 cylinder diesel engines a piece and slam them on the brakes and throttle back. The noise it makes is unbelievable. And so we all stopped. The other three boats had to stop, and he went around us. And of course, then we had to get back going again. And because I couldn't, the canal went up and did a hard right. I could see in front of me, but I couldn't shoot because of the, the boats. Mm -hmm. And I, I was watching the front boat, and it got to that corner, and the front boat just went bam and laid right over on its side. I mean, it was something huge. You know, laid right over the side, it pat, popped back up and went around the corner. And I said, Holy shit, I couldn't shoot. I could not shoot. I could not shoot. I could not shoot. And then the second one ran around, and it's getting all the smoke and the fire is so much that I couldn't see anything. And then, and then the next boat, and when we got there, I just opened up. Didn't even know where the hell I was shooting because it's so smoky. And all of a sudden, our boat goes boom. We got hit in, in our port engine. It knocked, knocked us down out of the water. And we were, you know, we were up at Pole Board, we were up on the plane, but it knocked us right down to where we just stopped. And we went over on our side and we're shooting. They knocked out our engine, mm -hmm. and so they're trying to. We're trying to get it started, and we're screaming on the radio, "Come back for us! We're down! Come back for us! We're down!" Well, at the same time, the lead boat was saying, uh, "Turn around, and get the hell out of here any way you can. We, we're, we're sinking." We thought they were coming back for us, and so we, kind of shooting all the, all the time, and. Uh, He's cranking the engine, trying to get it started. Well, it started. 
somehow I started to hit and a bowl that hole that way right through the goddamn thing and it still started. So we said, hey, we'll take the point. Because we thought we saw him coming back, so we got it, we were okay. And we didn't get the transmission, they said, get out of here any way you can. So they left. Mm -hmm. And we went up there all by ourselves and Jesus Christ, an awful lot of fire. We didn't know that until we got to a little straightaway and looked back. There's nobody there. We're all by ourselves. So I kind of reached down and grabbed the hold of my own sea and screamed, out, let's get the out of here, because we were all alone. Mm -hmm. And so he just, but like the helmsman went, bam, right up on the beach. To, we had to do this to turn around because it's so narrow. Well, I'm, while he's doing that, I looked down and I got five rounds hanging from my guns. That's all I had. I only had five rounds, but I thought of five, a thousand or so. Mm -hmm. So I, I had another belt down in the deck, but the way the uh, 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 a clip loads, you you know, you got to have a male and female type fittings, then you put a bullet through there, that locks them together. Before I could hook into the new set of belts, I had to get everything up. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm shaking so hard, and, and you hear all this gunfire. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, you just hear it. I mean, I just kept hauling them up, and I'm shaking so hard, I can't lay them straight enough. And we're trying to lay them down, and I was trying to lay them down in there. I finally got the, the, the last one up there, and then I could hook into it. Mm -hmm. Then I had to do the other side. And all this time we're doing this, trying to turn around. And about the time we got turned around, I got them both loaded, mm -hmm. hooked onto those last five rounds. Uh, I looked down and there's a bunker right there I never saw it going in. And of course I filled the slot mm -hmm. and I, as we went by and I swung around and Jesus Christ, there's another one. And that's the way it was, all the way out. Mm -hmm. And I shot two, I, you're supposed to show, shoot in short rounds so you don't cook your barrels and get them all up. And I didn't. I was shooting at anything and pretty soon near the end of the end of where we got back, gonna go get back out, my rounds are coming out and my guns and going about 10, 15 feet and hitting the water. And the, the, the cherry, the, the redness of the barrels were so cherry red and totally worn out that I was just making noise. But mm -hmm. I don't know, I still, if you hear a 50 caliber machine gun coming that your direction, you, you probably kept their heads down a little bit. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we, we got back out and we got around that corner and our engine died. And all the shooting stopped too. Mm -hmm. So I put my guns up like this and they, they, the girls are so hot they're still going off. The guns still going bam, 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 bam. Because as soon as the cha uh, round chamber, it, it cooked. Mm -hmm. We call it cooked off. And yeah. It kept going off. And uh, I leaned back and said, holy, we made it. And uh, I looked down there. There's uh, holes in my gun top. Where the fuck was I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know. Where could I have been? I, I must have been down getting ammo mm -hmm. when he went through. Mm -hmm. yeah. We got out and oh, we had, I forgot to say that we had a, a, a big TV crew from like NBC or ABC mm -hmm. or CNN or whatever that came on board and they were going to film this thing. We knew it was going to be bad because they were going to film it. And he got sick before we even left the dock and he was laying on the port engine cover. And because we got hit in that engine, we thought he got killed because he's just laying there. And we had a choice to kick him off mm -hmm. <laughs> or throw him onto the starboard engine cover. And we ended up, thank God, we threw him on the starboard engine cover because he was still alive. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, is everybody all right? And, now was he, did he have like a TV camera or just Yeah, a, great thing. Oh my goodness, yeah. So what, what happened to that? <laughs> he never even got it out. Okay. We, he put it inside the, uh, the boat itself in the, inside, and before we even left the pier, he was so seasick, he never got it out. All right. Now, do you suppose the unit commander decided to be the lead boat because he was going to be on television? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> I would think it may have something to do with it. Uh, you were talking about encountering bunkers and, and, and so forth. Aside from the machine gun, what else could you use against a bunker? Well, um, that was my um, main argument when I, we get into that type of situation. But I, I know that we, when we did other raids, 
I had carried that M70 grenade launcher, but we didn't. I didn't use that against bunkers okay. because it's, they're they're not war safe. In other words, mostly rounds like that, they mm -hmm. have to be about so many feet off the barrel before they're they're uh, they're armed. Right. And so if you shoot at something too close, you can the shrapnel can get you. Okay. So what would you shoot at with the M79? I, I would knock out uh, hutches and stuff. Mm -hmm. I could. Football field away at full bore, I can drop around the M79 or even the doorway. Okay. You've got a story in the memoir about using white phosphorus grenades. Uh, yeah, that's just that we had this new guy on board. He was a six, two, three big guy. And uh, he, he had this blue beret on, and he was a real badass looking dude. And uh, we went in to destroy the. Uh, this village, it was all VC. That was the one where the, we, we blew up the uh, barricade for us. Mm -hmm. We got to the village and they were all gone. I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, so we're just going to burn it to the ground. And this white phosphorus grenade is very big and heavy. And he looked like a big, strong guy. And the kill radius of a white phosphorus is like 30 feet. So you had to be, you had to throw it, it had long fuse, thank God. So you got time to mm -hmm. throw it way out there and back off. Well, this guy, he pulled the grenade because he was just gonna, we we're going to burn up some hooches over there. And he pulled the pin on the grenade and he wound back like he's going to throw it to the length of a football field. And he ended up getting thrown just like a girl. And it landed right beside our bow. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not past our bow, but right beside our bow. And of course, we backed out of there so damn fast. And, you know, two 12 cylinder diesels going in full reverse, the whole boat just shaking, trying to jump to get out of there. We get out of there just in time and it went off. All right. Now, this tape is about up, so we're going to okay. pause right here and rewind. All right. Now, we were talking about the, the fellow who turned out not to be a baseball pitcher <laughs> yeah. throwing the white phosphorus grenades. Yeah. What happened with him? Um, he said it was an accident and he's going to do another one. And he went over on the other side, did the same thing, five feet. We had to back away. And he said, again, that was an accident, because, but he's you know, a real tough guy. And he's going to go throw another. I said, no, you're, you're done. You're not going to throw, ever throw another grenade. You aren't going to throw it. And of course, he's a lot bigger than I was. And he says, he's going he's gonna, to he's gonna throw another grenade. And he says, no, you're not. And uh, he stepped outside the, on the, by the door there, to, and that's right, right below my 50s. And there's a, a, a guard, so I don't shoot my own man, mm -hmm. but that barrel was only about six inches above his head, and at the tip of right, right over the top, so that was going to be pretty loud. And he stepped out there, and I shot a, a six-round burst, and it knocked him right down. Knocked him right down. And he, of course, he called me a bunch of names. And he went out to go the other side. I just swung my fifties right over his head again. Lowered it, kump, as far as I could go, and opened the 50 calibers again, and he went down and didn't come back up. And uh, he didn't throw, a, never threw another grenade, but I know when we got back, they took him off the boat, and we never saw him again. Now, I don't know if they, he went into a hospital, because I'm sure it blew his eardrums out. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know if he went home. All I know, he was gone, and nobody died. Mm -hmm. and that's all I could think of is, you're going to kill us, and you aren't going to. Right. You've got a couple other stories in your memoir about different kinds of characters, and one of them was a new officer who came to the boat. <laughs> yes, yeah, he, uh, we, like I say, you don't have uh, a new person, only one new person at a time, because mm -hmm. that way you, you don't have any, uh, uh, nobody freezing. If they do freeze, you only have one person freeze, you don't have mm -hmm. the whole boat. And he was cockier in hell because he's an officer, you know, we were just enlisted people and he was being very I'm in charge type of attitude and he tried to, uh, he wasn't going to, uh, wasn't going to stand any night duty, you know, he, he was going to sleep. But for our boat to function at night was, we usually had one guy on the helm and watching the radar, watching the anything around us mm -hmm. and then we had like a bank of three or four radios that we monitored all the bases close by and uh, so 
you had two people, you had to have two people all the time, and the rest of us just slept on the boat somewhere. Mine was a, the, the starboard engine cover because it was nice and warm. And uh, but he would, and uh, we uh, really had a lot of discussion about him not standing watch, and plus he wanted to paint our boat were nice and pretty. And the whole thing is, is when you have a boat that's all shiny and new, that's like throwing out a red flag. You know, everybody wants a piece of that new new crew. So you don't you don't paint your boat. And uh, he we had a discussion about that, and he uh, kept saying, well, "We made us get the paint. We we, we brought it on board, but we weren't going to use it." And we pulled up alongside. You usually patrol minimum of two boats in the, mm -hmm. in the same river at the same time, so you can back up, you know, and kind of support each other. And during some time during the day, you would pull up alongside and have dinner together or something. Thing. And we pulled up alongside our sister boat, and we were talking. He says, "This character wants to paint our boat, and we're not going to do it." And uh, he kind of like. Yeah, probably not a good idea. And he says, yes, you are. And, well, we got into a big discussion about that. And he, I'm getting my stories mixed up here. But anyways, we didn't paint the boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we ended up getting into a, a position where we were boarding sandpans to, you know, check out for contraband and all that stuff. And he usually walked the boat up against their boat. And... That's when uh, I no longer am any good because I can't lower my 50s there, so they usually have me crawl out on the boats. And we were getting ready to do that. And the, the helmsman, he you know, walked the boat right up to it, and then we tied him to us. And then he has a 12 gauge shotgun right by the helm where he pulls off and, and he stands there and helps uh, guard while we down there. and. We pulled up alongside, but we didn't even get tied up, and something happened. I don't know what it was, but he was standing out in the very, almost by the bow there, and the rest of us were just starting to get down, and and he hit the throttle, two tall cylinder, twelve cylinder, twelve cylinder diesels, and that boat just leaps right out of the water, and you you can't be, I mean, you can't stand up, you have to grab onto something. Well, the guy was standing by, the helmsman did this kind of thing, trying to grab a hold of something while we. The only thing that was hooked right there was a 12 gauge shotgun. And, and uh, they're loaded. And uh, it went off. And the officer up front, he hit the deck. And uh, he got hit. And uh, we find out later, I gotta say it this way, that he got hit with one BB. He didn't get hit with a whole shot. And, uh, but we, had medevac him, you know, he's, he's screaming and hollering and all that stuff, and uh, we went down to the mouth of the river and met a medevac ship, and we, we were offloading him, and he kept yelling down on us, you really did it, you really did it, he <laughs> <laughs> just shut the hell up, <laughs> you do nothing now, he said, you really shot him, you really didn't know him, Christ, and we don't know where that rumor came from, <laughs> we, we, he said, it doesn't come from us, man, and you know, well, somewhere it came from somewhere, we don't know, but he was only gone for three days, and uh, or maybe less, I don't know, I can't remember, but he came back on the boat. Damn it, he's a good officer. Uh, we didn't have to paint our boat, and he's, he helped uh, night watches, and he ended up being the best officer we had. How many officers did you have? One officer on board. Yeah, but I mean, over the course oh, of the tour. I, I, I probably had three or four. Mm -hmm. I know I had at least three because I was on three different boats. Okay. But me had it, uh, another replay. Well, he, he came on board when I was on one, so mm -hmm. at least four of them that I had. And he was... Okay. Uh, How did you wind up switching from boat to boat? Did boats get damaged or you just rotate? Or? Rotate. Rotate. Uh, they had a new gunner coming on board and he says, Hey, we need you to cover this boat so we can put him on all by himself because mm -hmm. you never wanted more than one guy at a time and so uh, we, we rotated. Mm -hmm. I was on at least three boats, I don't remember too much about that, but I know I was on the 28 boat, the 37 boat, and I don't know what the 11 was, but I was on three different boats and we would 
and a new person would rotate in, or the, somebody, because we came in countries at all different times, mm -hmm. they would get shipped out, so then we'd get a new, new right. guy on board. Okay. Now, was there, would the men who were in crews on different boats, if you're all in the same barracks together, do you know each other? And I, uh, yeah, because when we, like I say, we always, when we were patrolling the same river, we pulled up and made dinner together and all that stuff, and so we, we knew each other pretty well. Okay, so you know more than just the crew of your own immediate boat, you know some of the other guys? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. We, like you say, because we, we, we would patrol a river with boat 29 or something like that, and later on we'd end up being a different boat. We always switch off because we don't have always the same boat mm -hmm. we're patrolling with, and, and, we, and we, so we had all different boats that we, but our barracks was always the same place, so when we did go back, we mm -hmm. partied pretty hardy together. <laughs> all right. Uh, you got a story in, in the memoir about, uh, I guess, a new guy coming in at night and yeah. not being very happy. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, he was a radar man. I didn't know what he was, but he, he had gone out on base. We just came back, and I was got to sleep in my own bunk for the first time in quite a while. And uh, he was coming in off of uh, partying at night and off base and he was a big, big guy. And uh, you hear some guy cussing and swearing and we hear pounding and screaming and I get up kind of look off over my bunk and here's this great big monster guy with a guy hanging off each arm trying to settle him down and he's punching the lockers. He hits them so hard they, they go flying. And I'm thinking, I'm not going to stop them. They, the two big guys came, they're hanging off his arms. I'm not going to stop them. So I guess I, I look at my, butt, my, my lock and think, oh shit, I'm going to have to clean all this up. And uh, he was walking down and cussing because somebody, he got drunk and got, uh, got his wallet stolen. And so he was kind of mad. And but by the time he got to where my bunk was, I'm thinking, yeah, well, this is it. His bunk was right across, right across for a night, and he got him in bed. And uh, Cool, my locker made it. Mm -hmm. And the next day, we got our new uh, radar, and it was him. Okay. Uh, holy shit, he ended up being the nicest, gentlest, loving, hard working dude. You know, he, he was awesome to have on board. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we actually became, he's the only one I actually became friends with. We, I went to, he lived in Detroit, and I went to his family's when we got out. He came to my family's when we got out. But, yeah. All right. Um, you have another story in here about uh, working with a Coast Guard ship. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's a good word. We uh, we were down in this one river. I don't remember names, but uh, right in the center of the big river was a great big huge island, and down one side of the island there was a uh, a canal. He wanted to, they wanted to get their combat action rhythms, what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. They wanted to go up there and get shot at. Well, uh, they couldn't even even think about turning around, so they would have to back out, because they thought they could go straight through, but they got too narrow. Mm -hmm. And I guess they got in, got there, what they were looking for, they got into a firefight with the, the people on the island, and all they had was 150 on the left side, or important, one that's on the right side, you know. And then maybe uh, it was 60 here and there, but they had less firepower than we did. Mm -hmm. And they're so high off the ground that they they couldn't shoot anything, you know. And so they're screaming at us, come back and help me, help us, we need help. And so we went in there, of course, and we did uh, take care of business and got them stopped. But uh, we had to escort them out because they had to back out. And it took them forever because they, you know, in a great big ship they had. So what was that? boat supposed to be doing? Out on the coast. Okay. He wasn't supposed to be in the rivers. So you're looking for sampans, not looking for firefights? He was He was looking for a... Uh, well, he was looking for a yeah, fight that day. But I, we do what I normally think is, is patrol there and mm -hmm. looking for sampans and um, looking for trouble, you know, that type of thing. But he, uh, he uh, bit off more than he could chew. Now, uh, were there a lot of islands in the rivers? Yes, quite a few islands in the rivers. We, one of the rivers that we, we 
is probably a, the, the very last one in the in the chain that we normally patrol. So we spent a lot of fuel getting down there, and so when we first chance we got to cut in, we cut in just by the island, and we had to go to the army base, which is around the tip of the island, and uh, we hadn't even uncovered the guns. They said, well, we better get refueled to go to do our patrols then, because I think it was a three-day patrol, so we had to refuel before we could even start patrolling. So we were going around that tip, and we were a little bit too close, and uh, we had them open up on us, and our guns are still even covered. And I said, holy shit. You know? So uh, we went straight away, and why well, we were going straight away, I uncovered my 50s and got them ready to go, and we spun the boat around and come back, I just chewed up the beach, you know. And uh, no, we didn't get hit, and I don't know what we did, but mm -hmm. we never got shot at again. <laughs> and uh, we went and refueled, and uh, we did that. Uh, that was quite an experience. All right. uh, now, aside from um, supporting ground troops, what else could you and the mortars for? Or at least you have another story in there about using them, I guess, when you were just using up extra ammunition. Yeah, at the, usually when we have a long open sea run that, you know, salt in the air and all that stuff, you, you gotta, after, if you haven't used your mortars in a while, uh, they, they, you want to get salt in there and salt water in the, the uh, mortar box. So we sometimes empty it. Mm -hmm. And then we say, hey, where's a good spot to shoot these rounds, you know? And we, they, they gave us the coordinates to give us, and so we just sat there and emptied our mortar round in this one area, and uh, I guess, because uh, they said, oh, there's a bunch of VC there, and there's some whole bunch, and we said, yeah, okay, we'll drop them in there. We did, and then about two days later, I guess, uh, a VC, Chief Hoyt, mm -hmm. turned himself in, and he says, we, we hit him pretty bad. And so, we did some damage there, and, right. and that was just getting rid of the old rounds. Okay. Uh, do you have encounters uh, with wildlife or livestock? Um, yeah, well, uh, livestock was only one thing. But uh, wildlife, we we went up in this one river where we it was a pretty long ways that where, where we our, our patrol was long, and at night you can hear you can hear our, our engines and say so we'd go up we turn around and come back and we'd go up and come around and come back um, and they'd, they'd listen to us and we got far enough away they'd quit go across the, the river and get, before we could turn around and come after them they were already on the other side the time we got there so we going to be real smart and dropped off two of our guys on this tiny little island that uh, was right where they were crossing and so we told them you know let us know when they this way you can first see them getting ready to go you know, and all that stuff. So we we went down and uh, they called back kind of excited, very excited. And uh, so we ran back up there and they didn't catch anybody. But uh, there's, a, I guess, wild pigs on that island. And uh, they move around that night. And here are these poor two guys with M16s and couple of grenades on them and uh, you know they, I mean, that's all they had on them and they called us up like I said the radio and said come and get us come and get us come and get us we don't know, you know they, they couldn't they didn't know what the heck went on they couldn't see it's pitch black so we get there and here's the poor guys who are back down into the river up to their waist aiming their guns at the beach and then they, and it's just pigs just scared the hell out of them <laughs> and so we didn't do that again uh, we didn't uh, you think we can learn, but pretty cocky Americans. We're gonna get, we're gonna get them, but we didn't really get them. I know we, a couple of times we almost caught, just at dusk we would uh, come down the river and come around the corner of an island, we'd come around the other side and there's somebody crossing. And I remember uh, we were gonna try and stop and we were going full bore at and they kept Going, we, we had great big speakers telling the dumb lie, stop and mm -hmm. stop and all that stuff. And um, I ended up shooting some rounds in front of their bow, thinking that'll stop and let them know that there's something coming. They kept going, and I 
bring him in a little closer. He just kept right on going. And uh, so there was somebody on board that they didn't want us mm -hmm. to catch. But we, we, I didn't shoot them. I didn't kill them. They, they made it all the way to the other side. And about the time we got there, at the same time, and here's the boat just jammed up into the brush and nobody's on board. And so I just kind of did damage on the boat a little bit. But uh, we never, never caught anybody. All right. Uh, there are some kind of standard sort of Vietnam stereotypes and things that, that, that come up that I'll kind of just ask your, your perspective on. One of them has to do with race relations. I mean, was everybody in your boat white, or was there a mix of people in the boats? There was never any trouble there. I don't know if they were, I don't even remember. I know a lot of them were white, and most of them were white. But um, we were, you know, we were a crew, we were mm -hmm. brothers. And I don't remember a whole lot about that. So. And it wasn't the base, I mean, there weren't a lot of just base personnel or other people that you saw much of. No. Um, I heard, we heard an awful lot about it. In the army, mm -hmm. the army bases had a lot of problems. Yeah. But uh, there's only six of us on the board. Yeah. So you, you got to be, and the only thing, you rely on those six people. Mm -hmm. And so we never, we had one person that uh, he came on board our boat, and uh, you, know, you hear about all this drugs all the time, mm -hmm. but we didn't have any of that. Okay. And with this one gunner's mate, he came on our sister boat. And he, he, he smoked marijuana and stuff. And we got out into a pretty good firefight, and he didn't do a very good job. He was he was higher than a kite. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we got back, he never came back on the boat. And so we we, we didn't, I mean we drank, but usually afterwards, mm -hmm. <laughs> but nothing to jeopardize our people. Now you were in Vietnam for a full year. Did you get an R&R &R at some point? Uh, I was supposed to, yeah. And I told him, you know, if I leave this place, I'm never coming back. Mm -hmm. So I stayed right in my barracks. There's an in-country R&R place right by us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Vung Tao, or is that yeah. what we, yeah. And I didn't even go there. I didn't even go there. I mean, that's what you, you can hear the people that, uh, I mean, they, they did water skiing. And, Mm -hmm. Swimming and all kinds of stuff on that base, but I, I never said, "You, if I leave here, I am never coming back." So I didn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got to go to Australia, Japan, and mm -hmm. all kinds of. I mean, people would come back saying, "Oh man," and saying, "I wouldn't come back." You know, so right. no, I didn't go. All right. Um, okay. Now, I just want to see. Okay. Um, you mentioned at a certain point you actually got up as far as Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. that river where that big uh, island is, mm -hmm. uh, they had a new PBR for to go up to Cambodia and they were stationed where we went and got the old fuel. Mm -hmm. And so we went up there to the meet fuel and uh, we have big gas tanks. And the PBR that we we're going to escort up there had obviously smaller mm -hmm. gas tanks. And so they were going to ride in our wake and save fuel. And I don't know how this ever happened, but we, we got drinking quite a bit. And uh, they were in our wake trying to, you know, save fuel. And their bowels slid off our wake and caught in a river and threw everybody overboard. He did 180 degrees. The only person that was, wasn't, didn't get thrown overboard by the PBR was the, the guy hanging onto the helm. The rest of them did. We went back for him, and they, mm -hmm. they went back, they loaded him back up. And we all got sobered up pretty quick. Was and, that an American crew, or was that Vietnamese? No, American, no. I, we never did. They weren't turning over the boats just then. Okay. It was all American. And by the time we got to the Cambodian border where we went, Escorted him to everybody was sober and dry. And, uh, that's the only. Now, were you on a branch of the Mekong River at that point, do you well, think? Or? Oh, we were on one of the rivers. Yeah, I don't remember which one. I can't remember which what name of it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, it went all the way up until, to, to, into Cambodia. Okay. It was a big river, fairly wide? It started that way. Yeah. And it kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. 
um, and they got faster and deeper. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an unusual situation because a lot of times we'd get caught into a whirlpool and the boat would just sit there and we, we, got, we were trying to go forward and it wasn't going forward. And so, uh, but uh, usually we, we, we could work our way out of it because we got kind of out of power. We were, but you were, if you were drinking on that mission, was the expectation that that particular mission was not dangerous? That nobody was going to bother you? I don't know the answer to that. I think that's what we figured. It, that they were going up there with no guns on them, so we were yeah. escorting them. And uh, they were just running right at the center of the river. Mm -hmm. We weren't looking for... Okay. And then did you bring that crew back with you? No, no. Well, they, they, they went up there and that's where their station was. Okay. And, of course, you're there... Um, basically in 1969, yeah. uh, and the official Cambodian incursion doesn't happen until 1970. <laughs> but we're operating there in They were doing long before we went in there, that's for sure. They were there All right. many, many years before us All right. when I went up there. All right. Um, now you mentioned at a certain point also um, working with Marines, you actually, I mean, the, the Marines are known mostly for being up in the far northern part. Well, I, 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 I want to say the Marines, I never met the people, okay. but I was, they were, we went up, again, we didn't have a sea lord rate, so we were just going to, the night, we were going to anchor, and uh, we usually go out in the deepest part and widest part of the river and anchor, and uh, I think we were too close to one bank. Mm -hmm. And we were anchored there, and uh, I was sleeping on my favorite starboard engine. Uh, you don't sleep inside because if you got hit with a rocket, the concussion would mm. kill you or pretty much mangle you. And so we were just anchored there, and we had one guy in the boat, I mean, one on the radar, and one on the helm, and we were basically anchored. Excuse me. And uh, I'm laying there, and all of a sudden I hear gunfire. I hear uh, AK-47s and M-16s, and of course, they're so close together, I couldn't tell. All I saw was muzzle flashes like this. I thought at first they were coming at us, so I jumped up my gun top, lowered my 15, it was just going to open up on it, and the guy down on the helm banged my foot. He said, hold fire, hold fire. I said, what the? What do you mean, hold fire? You? And in that second or two that I held fire, I realized that the bullets were going this way, not coming out at us. Mm -hmm. And so I just, we just stood there. I just stood there just ready to go any minute because we knew what was going on. And obviously, we found out later that I, I said Marines because that's, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. I don't really know for sure, but I, I, they, a patrol, let's put it this way, I ambushed a BC patrol that was mm -hmm. going to ambush. They were out on the beach getting ready to set up. It's, ambush us and they mm -hmm. ambushed them and after the firefight was over with you know we're sitting there who won <laughs> what do we do and finally the I, I keep saying marines they uh they called us on the radio and says we got him he says okay well i think we're going now so we pulled in and got the hell out of there <laughs> Odds are they were arming just because of where you were, but... I probably, but I, I said Marine, because one thing, my, I have a Marine buddy that we, we did a lot. He got, like, he got blown up pretty bad over there. And we, and I, we did do a lot of special forces people. Mm -hmm. and so I, I don't know. Like I say, I was Navy. I didn't know. Right, but yeah. We all look alike. Yeah, we all look alike. All right. Uh, now... Let's see, the, at, at a certain point you got um, a Navy commendation, and what particular action was that for? Um, the first three months, that's not for it, it's for the middle three months. Mm -hmm. For six months, I mean in, in the middle. Yeah. That, and that's why, I, I don't know what officer it was, but he was very, kept a lot of good records and mm -hmm. stuff, and uh, I can't, I mean, because I never knew. I, I, I just shoot him, man. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he uh, wrote me up for the number of sand pans mm -hmm. that I, uh, I knocked out. Because we go into a place, I just blow everything up. Uh, 
in bunkers and you just blow them all up. And, um, so basically, it was it was something for just kind of doing your job. Exactly what that was, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a a six month period that you must have been on my boat, mm -hmm. and uh, it was I read it and it scared me. You know? <laughs> and it, 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 the very first yes. the very first firefight I was in, you know, it was not in there because it's it in the middle of six months. Right. So those firefights is not in that book. And the last one, the last three months were not in. It was the ones in between, and those are the two ones that affected me the most. The first and the last, mm -hmm. and uh, so um, that blew my mind when I read that because they, they put us up in a nice big parade and trying to make it sound glorious. And it wasn't too mm -hmm. glorious to me. All right. Now to think back at the time that you spent in Vietnam, are there other particular memories you want to bring into the story that you haven't talked about yet? I know when we went to go on a raid that um, we were coming up the river and we we're supposed to cut into this one canal in the daytime and it was going to be a all we see camp back there and we knew it was there, they knew too that we were there and coming up the river we were coming up faster, pull more so they sounded like we were going to go right on by. And what we did was make a hard left and then go in that canal. Well, as soon as we made the hard left, I looked up and here's this cable hanging across about this high on me. And of course, I'm screaming down there to stop, stop, stop. And uh, we came to a stop and that thing was right up against the gun tub. And uh, we didn't, if, it, if we didn't, if I wouldn't have saw it, it would have chopped me right in the hand. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the, uh, we didn't know if it was a booby trap, would it? Didn't, Clean more mines on both sides of us and wiped us all out, or what? So once we got stopped, we we cut the cable and then went up there, and it was all. I mean, people were just standing there with their. They didn't, they, they didn't have time to go anywhere, mm -hmm. and so they're just standing there with nothing in their hands or whatever. And we had a couple of. Uh, I don't know if there were, Vietnamese policemen or, army regulars, mm -hmm. but. Uh, they, lined, they were already lined up. They made them line up a little straighter, I guess. And they were asking him, he knew it was VC. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, no, no, no. And, uh, and uh, they killed him. And that's when they, they showed us where all the guns were. And we hauled them off. And it was, that was, uh, wow. You know, I, I don't even know where we took them. I mean, we must have been an army base close by that we took, we took them to or whatever. Because mm -hmm. we picked the army guys or the policemen or whatever they were up close by within, you know, like five or six miles. And they went in there and looking for trouble. Okay. Uh, in the pictures that you've got, you've got a shot of what seems to be a kind of so along the shore, but some kind of store or shop or something yeah. like that. Was that a Vietnamese operation or was that well, a base? Was a or? General, yeah, it was a general uh, civilian grocery store or boat rental or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was just a, a, a little town. And uh, that's, it was supposed to be always friendly. Mm -hmm. And we, we ran into a couple of places that weren't. Uh, I, I, it's something to that effect. I don't know if that was a picture of whatever, but I'm always up in my gun tub, and somebody opened up on us. And we're in town. Mm -hmm. So all I did was just lay a fire right over top of the town, and it stopped. And so. And would you stop at any of these towns and get off? or? Would... Um, the only time we got off is when we blew the heck out of that one company or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they told us they, we wiped them right out. And, and for some reason we said, oh, let's go take a look. And we, we got off, the, a couple of us got off the boat and, and we walked into where they where we supposedly wiped everything out. And that was the stupidest thing you could possibly think of, but we did it. But, but normally you don't get off. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, some of the South Vietnamese basically we stop and we fuel and pick up people and do stuff like that, but we don't normally. Right. We would help them fish. We would, 
the poor little Vietnamese boys down with these little throw nets. You throw in a big circle and it comes down and you pull up and you get a little minnow or something on the inside there. We told them, back out of the way, get out of the water, get back on the shore. And we would drop a concussion grenade over the side and all the fish would float up. <laughs> and they, ah, they come over there and grab all the fish because the big ones, what they couldn't fight in this, that way they pull it right up to the top. So we did that a couple of times. All right. Now, uh, did your duties change at all at the end of your tour? I, I, I'm not sure what you or did mean. did you stay off of, I mean, you talked about your last mission, and in the memoir it suggests that for a while they just kept you on shore or at the base. Well, yeah, after the last mission where I, we got shot up really bad, my gun tub was full of holes. There's a couple of times I've been, when we were in some pretty bad firefights, that I'd go into shock and feel... Mm -hmm. I come off a, we came out of a patrol that, um, hey, we did all right. I look around from my vantage point, I can see everybody's fine. I say, hey, we're all right. And I, I climb down and the guy in the other, the, F-50 come up and started shaking me. He started screaming at you, all right, you all right? I say, yeah, what the hell's up, man? And he says, you should have seen the tracers going by your head. <laughs> so I crashed a little bit during that time. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but, uh, yeah, now you got me going on this. Another time we came out of patrol where we thought we'd come out smelling like a rose because we couldn't. That's the set. Nobody said, cool. So we're sweeping the old the brass off the back, you know, the, in the river. And the guy that was an uh, aft gun guy, he was leslie enough, he looks over and looks at the back of our mortar box. And there's five holes in it. And there's no holes in the front. So I wonder where they went. Mm -hmm. And so we very carefully unloaded the rounds and kept looking at them. And we found that, see, they're in cardboard boxes. And the thing is, there's open uh, bags of gunpowder for the projectile part of it. And then, so if you hit one of those, or, I mean, one 81 millimeter mortar would blow our boat to hell right. in the whole mortar box full. Mm -hmm. wouldn't have been, they wouldn't even find anything. And so we very gently found them, very carefully and very gently lowered them over the side and thank God. Okay. Now that time when your boat was, was it a recoilless rifle that went through the engine? Yeah. And then did that shell not explode? Did it just push right through the engine and out the other side? I think it blew up inside the engine. Okay. Because we had a hole that big going in and there was nothing coming out the back sides. I don't know what, because of because the end covers opened up this way, so we got out, and they're, they're so tight together that I couldn't, we, I didn't, we didn't hit the other boat, the other engine, so it had to get stopped inside there. Okay. Well. But if it blew up, it would have, you probably couldn't have started the engine. I, I can't answer that, but I think I, I tell you, uh, Jim, I, there's so many times that I, I, I don't know how I, I'm, I'm still alive in here, mm -hmm. I really don't, I have no clue, because there's many times that I should not be here. Okay. All right. Now you get now to the to the end of your tour. Uh, how do they get you back to the states? Um, I flew back. Okay. Uh, I, I was off the boats for the last probably week or two because I was I was worth a shit because mm -hmm. that was the time that they, they hit that mortar and right. it, my gun tuck was all blown to hell. Mm -hmm. I was useless. And you get when you first come in the country, you're scared after your death and you ain't worth a damn. Mm -hmm. And then about halfway through, you say, I don't got. I'm going to take as many of these bastards with me as I can, so you, you get a little bit cocky. Mm -hmm. And then after you get started, you know, near the end, you think, maybe I'll make it after mm -hmm. all. And so you start to be a little bit nervous, and it gets worse and worse as you get closer. And mm -hmm. So when it was time for me to go, we just, they went, Robin, why don't you take the last week or two off? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I was just on base. I didn't do anything. All right. And then you blew me out. Okay. And where do you land in the States? California. Um, I want to see. I don't know that. The, what? It'd be San Francisco. Yeah, so it must be yeah. something like that. But I don't remember exactly. But all I remember, coming off the plane and there's no Bob wire fence. Mm -hmm. And it was so cool. And we had such a tailwind that uh, I got back. The next day I had flight to go to Saginaw, Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, we got back so early that I had enough time to get checked in and got on the plane a whole day early. 
Okay. Thank you. Now, when you get back to the States, did you encounter any protesters in the airports or anything like that? I, I was blessed in that way because uh, I heard of, we heard a lot about that. But uh, on the, the San Diego where we flew in at, I think that was a big enough base that they didn't, uh, that wasn't there very long. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see anything. And then I flew into my hometown and there was all kinds of people there, but they were for me. Mm -hmm. And my little brother, he was supposed to be, go to Vietnam and I told you he got orders and I was there and he didn't have to go so he came home on leave the same day mm -hmm. from, from the army and uh, I flew in and I, I get the last one from Chicago to Saginaw uh, I flew standby and of course the military standby is one thing but then a, a veteran a Vietnam veteran standby gets a little more mm -hmm. and so I bumps somebody and I this is my story, and so I'm going to tell it the way I have it. Richard said they don't know for sure, mm -hmm. but I bumped one person, obviously, and I think he was supposed to be on that flight coming mm -hmm. from up in the army base, was down south somewhere. And he got bumped, and that was mm -hmm. probably by me. <laughs> by the time I I got home and got all the people waiting for me, I got drunker and a skunk again. We, of course, I uh, my dad says after about an hour and a half, he says, um, "We got to go back to the airport." I said, what do you mean? He says, Rich Cummins home. Mm -hmm. So, he's a big mouth. And uh, he's always smart mouth and all that shit. And he got out of the plane and saw me, because he was supposed to do that for me the next day. Mm -hmm. I wasn't due back. And he didn't say a word, he couldn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cool. Hey, Rich, that's the first time you ever shut up. <laughs> and uh, we got kind of drunk out there. I tell you, we were home for, I had three days leave, plus they gave me a little more time, because uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we were home for three days together. He went he went to Germany, and I went down to, uh, I don't know if it was Charleston, South Carolina, and got on these same boats mm -hmm. on base only. Okay. So I didn't have to go back out at all. All right. So how long did you spend down there? In, in Charleston or whatever the last. It party. wasn't a whole year, I don't think. Okay. I don't know how long it was, but I remember that they want to do a bunch of maneuvers with you know. So you got to give them some practice, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to go uh, go on these. Uh, when I went up to Woodby Island at the training we did mm -hmm. in the woods and all that stuff, they wanted me to go in there and help them. I said I'm not. Go. He was like, we can we can shoot all blanks. Mm -hmm. I said I'm not. I, I mean, you can't shoot a 50 caliber machine or this at me, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's pretty bad. It probably still am. And I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> shoot out of luck. I'll take care of the boats. And that's what I did. I, I stayed home, basically. All right. Uh, did they make any effort to encourage you to stay in the Navy? Yes. Uh, Malta, south of Italy. Mm -hmm. The Maltese police would have a lot of problems with drug runners, and they wanted us to go over there and teach them on, our, on my swift boats mm -hmm. how to, you know, search and search boats and all that stuff. And I was supposed to get a three months early out. And uh, then he said, no, we're going to actually extend you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go over too good with me. <laughs> and I, I got a kind of a little bit upset about it and told him where to go. And, uh, I says, well, if you can find somebody that can take your position on the boat, we'll let you go. Well, I found a PBR guy, and I trained him on my boat. Mm -hmm. And then he took my place, and I got to come home. Okay. So that was... All right. So once you've gotten out of the Navy, now what do you do? Um, I... I, I, I guess I went into civilian life. I started, mm -hmm. the guy, I, I came home, was just home on leave, and then somebody was installing carpet and linoleum in my, my, my parents' house, and I was kind of laying on the floor watching them. And so he said, do something. And so I ended up doing, I went into floor covering for a while and countertops, and, uh, and then I, I, I did all kinds of things, like custom cabin building. I, I did uh, electric motor repair. Then I ended up writing manuals for machinery for 
when the Ford and Chrysler and GM all have these great big machines in the plants that mm -hmm. assemble, assemble your engines. I, I wrote the wrote the step by step instructions how to operate them, maintenance, and the training on it. So I did that. How did you wind up with that job? Yeah, um, my little brother, the one I the one in the army with, he he's a uh, very good at writing and stuff, so he got into that. Well, I went photography. I, I mm -hmm. wanted to go into service. That's what I wanted to be. Right. So I had taken that up after I got out, and just for playing. And he says, hey, I got to go down to this one plant down in Indiana, and I got to have pictures taken. Can you go with me? And I wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go with you. And uh, after I was there taking pictures for him, and all this time, and he was so swamped at his regular job, this is another plant that down there. He says, you, you've got to write the manuals. And I said, the hell I am, because I don't know how to write manuals. And, and he um, got me started and I get getting better at it, because I always want to do the best I can possibly mm -hmm. do. And I got pretty good at it. And in fact, as he says, you know, these manuals are pretty nice. Now you've got to teach it. I can't talk in front of people. And he said, no, you've got to, you've got to teach it. So they end up, and my sweet little brother, he says, yeah, he'll do it. <laughs> I said, you, you what? And I, I'm shaking the hell in front of me. But the only thing I figured out, which helped me, because I wrote the manuals. Mm -hmm. I never inch those machines. And so when I got in front of all these people standing there looking at me, like, yeah, what do you know? And I started to tell them that uh, uh, if you have any problems with these manuals and you have a... Uh, if there's anything you find wrong and doesn't explain it right, you let me know. I'll kick the guy's ass. And then I, and they all, yeah, right, you will. I said, well, yeah, because I wrote them. And then he, it came easier because they, they did have questions that I could answer them. So I did that until cancer got me. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, you're, you have health issues that relate to the Anon service, as far as you know? Yeah, I started out with. Mantel cell with no more, which is a, a blood cancer. And lymph nodes, your lymph nodes try to clean your blood. Well, they swelled up huge. And I tried to get the army, or the army, the military to mm -hmm. do something about it. And they said, well, uh, I had to get on the list to get on the list so I can get on the list to get in. And I couldn't, you know, I'm, in, I'm watching this thing swell up almost, mm -hmm. this, my, my leg. And uh, I finally went to a private doctor, and uh, um, he uh, did a biopsy, and uh, he says, "Yeah, you got stage four mantel cell lymphoma, cancer. You got to start chemo right now." And, and I was paying for this for myself, and I, I said, "I, I got to make the, knee, the military pay for this because I can't afford that." Then. So I got the paperwork from them, and I went to the VA, and they still I couldn't get in. And they slammed that down on their desk and told them what the hell I, what the story was. And they took me in the back room and got talking to a doctor, and he said, just send me right back. And two, three days later, I was in the arm getting chemo. Mm -hmm. But I had to spend years. They wouldn't pay off my initial thing because they said, well, you could have come to us. And I said, you son of a bitches, I tried to come to you and you wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, you wouldn't take me. And I didn't, I don't have time to play around. And so I ended up having to pay for my own original. Mm -hmm. But they, from then on, they were, they were absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. for me. All right. Then I did. I had, ended up getting prostate cancer after that. And then, and I had a bone marrow, bone marrow transplant. They did all kinds of things on me. Uh, do you think you were exposed to Agent Orange? Absolutely. I was sprayed with it. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we were on a um, support mission. We, we, we dropped off a bunch of troops and, and we just run our bow up on the beach and then we sit there with our 81 ready to go and uh, we we wait to see if they need any help. We give them some help. And we're sitting there, and um, it started to rain. I kind of look up, there's a cloud in a billion miles, you know? And it was Agent Orange. He got sprayed with Agent Orange. And so that was how I got 
is after that. All right. And did you have um, some version of, of a PTSD or something along uh, that line? Yeah, quite a bit. I still do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that will ever go away or not, but I still jump. And it was worse the first 10 years. The first year I had to sleep with a gun. And then the, the next 10 years I would... I'd cry myself to sleep because thinking all the things I did. I killed a lot of people. I killed a lot of people. And I was so ashamed of what I did. And it was, so, and it, I, I married a woman in 71, 72, something like that. And uh, she was a godsend to me. I mean, she helped me the best way she could, but she could stick around so long that it just never went away. And so, after 24 years, she had enough, and I put her through enough. So, I let her go, and uh, that was in 95, and uh, that pretty much knocked, it was pretty much Nothing like it was at the beginning when she had she had to go through. Mm -hmm. I still have nightmares. It wasn't for these memoirs that I wrote. It still had would have a hold on me. For the first time, I could feel it let go of me. Mm -hmm. I know what I did, and I know what really helped was the fact that my people, all my people in my boat, came home alive. Mm -hmm. My people came home. And that's the only thing that saved my ass because I never looked at it that way because I just looked at what I did, the families I destroyed, the people I destroyed. And for the first time I understood that my people came home. And that was war. That was war and, and people die in war and it took a long time for people to get that through my fixed call. And my little brother was one of them. And Amy here that has she helped me talk through some of this stuff. Um, it really, I understood that that was war, and I I did my job, mm -hmm. and, it, and I had nothing to be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. So my my people came home, and I was very kind of proud of that. And that's when mm -hmm. I finally started to get out of this mm -hmm. nerve around cancer and stuff. Yeah. Now to look back at the time that you spent in the service, do you think you took anything positive out of it? <laughs> oh God, that's a good one. I, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that. I was very bitter for so many years, but... Do you think you learned anything or gained any kind of perspective or... It all the war is stupid. Mm -hmm. War is stupid, and, and the only people who get hurt are the little peons, the generals and the, uh, the presidents and all that. And, and not just our side. I'm mm -hmm. talking both mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't fight the wars. They don't. They don't get out there in the, the nitty gritty. They don't mm -hmm. die. They just point the finger and say, "You go," and that's I'm a little bitter in that sense. The fact that. You you don't have a don't have a clue what you just told me to do. Mm -hmm. You don't have a clue what it means to go over there and shoot these people and kill them. You know, mm -hmm. well, these poor guys that I was fighting were people just like me, except on the other side. Mm -hmm. They were told, uh, "You shoot those Americans, or I'll I'll kill your daughter." Mm -hmm. You know, here's a gun. You you, you you fight the Americans, and if you don't, I'll just kill your daughter. And so, what choice did they have? And so I have nothing, I have nothing against the Vietnamese people. I, I do have to do with the, the generals and the, those people. I, I will never be very happy with them. I, you're not, they don't have a clue. And what you're doing right here, I hope to God that this helps people understand that it isn't pretty. It isn't pretty and there's no honor, you know, they want, They tried to tell me I'm doing this for God and country. I wasn't doing it for God, that's for sure. 
I'm not killing his people or our people or my people for God. And I sure didn't think I was doing this for country. Big business, the, the weapons people, the, the Agent Orange people, all making all these making all this money off the, the wars. I wasn't doing it for my country. I was doing it for in my my actual fight of the six people. That's what I was mm -hmm. fighting for to keep them alive. That's and get them so they can come home and be their families because that big radar man that was my buddy, he had a family with three kids then or four kids or something like the mm -hmm. Italian, you know, so they had a lot of, and I was so glad that he got to come home to his kids. I was so proud of that. And of course we, we did it together, mm -hmm. we, all of us. Well, it, it, it makes for a pretty powerful story, and I appreciate your willingness to come and share it today, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad I can hopefully...